Here we are for our weekly devotion in Santa Fe, New Mexico at Ascent Bible Church. I'm Larry Socia, Associate Pastor, and today we are going to do the devotion on the Word of the Week, which is Joshua. So let's pray. Father, as we gather today, Lord, and consider your will, your ways, and your Word, we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would open up new visions to us, understanding that surpasses human knowledge, Lord, and is dependent on supernatural, godly vision. Uh, as we go through your word today, Lord, I pray that you would use it for your glory and to build your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to start out today talking about Joshua and what's in that name. Uh, the original Hebrew, Old Testament, you find either Yehoshua or Yoshua. And I'm going to talk about how that, how that came about. Um, Yehoshua is a compound name from Yeho, which is a form of the tetragrammatron meaning four letters, Y-H-W-H. And the Hebrew writers and the Hebrew people all considered the name of God so sacred that they wouldn't write it out and they wouldn't even say it. Um, it was shown as Y-H-W-H. It means God Almighty, the God of creation, the God of heaven and earth, the God of the universe. And uh, if anybody says it, they either say Yahweh or Yahoo. And so the first part of Yehoshua is Yeho. The second part is Shua, which means a cry for help. And when you put them together, you get Yehoshua. Cry to God for help. And that's what we are called to do. That's what the Hebrews, especially in Egypt and throughout the desert experience did and many times as they were moving into the promised land. So you find though that writers of scripture as well as in society, they would contract Yeho to Yo. And so that would shorten Yehoshua to Yoshua, becoming Yeshua in the Greek and Jesus in the English. And so we see that Joshua is a type of Christ and in the Christ that we know it's Yeshua Ha Mashiach. Yeshua meaning Jesus. Ha is the and Mashiach, Messiah. Now, the significance of that we see in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And as a type of Christ, we see Joshua leading the children of Israel into the promised land. And of course, Jesus leads us as his people into the promised land of heaven. This truth, it becomes the purpose that is the basis for everything that is going on in the entire universe. If you accept this perspective, everything that's happening today, in this world, in your life, in the lives around you, and even in the universe, will begin to make sense, and you will find peace in the midst of it all. And in that summary, you see the words of the last three devotions, purpose, perspective, 
and peace. And we tie it together today in Joshua, Yeshua, Jesus, the one about whom all history revolves. So let's look at the beginning passage of Joshua, the book of Joshua. There are several key concepts in the first nine verses. I want to cover them today. And I encourage you, don't just look at this video message or watch it live as we're live streaming, but go back, re-look, reread the verses that we talk about, meditate on it, and consider, because there is so much in here that just a, a brief passing over will have minimal impact. But if you really take it to heart, engage with it, you will find the Holy Spirit working wonderful things in your strength, in your endurance, in your faith, and in your peace over the days and weeks to come. So let's look at Joshua 1, verses 1 to 9. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. I have to tell you, this passage gives me chills and much excitement because even though it's God speaking unto Joshua at a very critical time in the history of, of Israel's deliverance from Egypt and entry into the Promised Land, it has so much applicability even to us this day if we take it to heart if we believe it, if we trust it, if we act upon it. And I want to cover several key concepts that are in this passage. The first one is verse 2, about crossing the Jordan. They're about to cross the Jordan. And, and in Scripture, water is a transition point. We can see in Exodus that when Israel is being delivered by Moses out of the oppression of Egypt, they cross through the Red Sea. 
into the wilderness. And now in Joshua, the water they're going to cross through is the Jordan River. And I see this as having a parallel in our lives because we're born into the Egypt of this world which has control and great oppression in our lives. And if we cross through the water of baptism into Jesus Christ, he takes us basically out of the control of the world and into the wilderness because though we have left this world in our spiritual hearts and in our minds, we're still in a wilderness that falls far short of the heaven that we desire. And eventually, if God tarries, each one of us will cross another river, the River Jordan, and we will enter into the promised land. Now the thing about the desert is that it doesn't satisfy. It doesn't satisfy the desires of our heart to be with the Lord. But it is a place where only God can nourish. God brings the water. God brings the manna. The water of the Holy Spirit. The manna of His daily word. And He provides sustenance for us in this barren wilderness that falls so far short of the promises that he's given us that will be fulfilled in heaven. And that, that's where David the psalmist says, I, I hunger and I thirst. My soul thirsts for you as in a parched and dry land. And when, when we really look to God to fulfill his promises, we will never truly be satisfied with anything the world has to offer. And as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, um, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be filled. So a couple things I want to say just about the two occurrences of water in the deliverance of, of Israel, the Red Sea and the Jordan. Now I'm not going to read the passages, but I have them listed on the screen, Joshua chapter 3 verses 9 to 17, and Exodus chapter 14 verses 16 to 31. God commands Israel to go through the waters in each case. In the Exodus passage, he has Moses stretch out the staff and the waters are parted. In Joshua, he has the priests carry the Ark of the Covenant, which was constructed while they were in the wilderness and Moses didn't have it at the Red Sea. He has the priests carry the Ark of the Covenant into the river and as soon as their feet touch the water, the river is parted. It's stopped up way above where they're going to cross. It's just like a, a dam was, was created and the river stops flowing. And in both cases, the Israelites pass through. Not only just safety, but on dry ground. And yet, in each case, once the Israelites are passed through, Moses withdraws the staff, the priests come up out of the water, and the waters close back in. In the case of the Exodus passage, the parting of the waters means life for Israel. The return of the waters means death to their enemies. In the case of the Jordan, the parting of the waters means access and entrance of Israel into the promised land. And the closing or the return of the waters means that the way back to the wilderness has been shut. We're going forward now. No looking back. We see the danger of looking back and backsliding in the story of Lot 
leaving Sodom and Gomorrah. And as his wife looked back, she was destroyed. There's nothing in Egypt for sure, and there's nothing in the wilderness that is of any value that we should go back for. It. Let's continue forward in our walk with the Lord and be ready to move with His command to be strong and courageous. So the second part, verse 5, and repeat it again two other times. Stand. Stand courageously. Well, let's look at 1 Corinthians 16.10. Watch ye. Stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. This is Paul talking to the Corinthians. Where do we stand? We stand in faith. And quit you is a way of saying, um, behave like men. Do what men do. Stand strong. You stand in the gap. Stand for your wife. Stand for your children. Stand for your church, your brothers and your sisters. Stand for your nation. Stand for God because you're standing fast in the faith and be strong. And a passage that everyone's pretty familiar with if you've attended any services in this church, Ephesians 6, 12 to 14. Why must we stand? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand Therefore, and it follows that we're standing by putting on the whole armor of God. And again, just as the waters spelled life for Israel and death for Pharaoh and his army, the passage in Joshua chapter 1 says, No man will be able to stand against you, but you. You will be able, you must be able to stand in faith that your God will take you where he has promised to take you. Now in verse 6 of that passage in Joshua 1, we have a promised inheritance. In Romans 8, 16 and 17, we learn a little bit about what that promised inheritance is. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together with him. And there's some insight there because anything that is of value requires sacrifice, it requires effort, and oftentimes it brings suffering along with it. Not only so that you can overcome all the obstacles, all the doubts, all the unbelief, all the fears, all the naysayers, all of the stumbling blocks and pitfalls, but that you may add that much greater value to what you have when you have it. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 to 5, we get another picture of this inheritance. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope 
by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There's the suffering of Jesus Christ that took his life and the benefit of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. To what? To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away. But is it in this desert? No. Reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Three things about this inheritance. It's incorruptible. Nothing can be done to tarnish it, to spoil it in any way. Why? Because it's kept in heaven. The world has no access to it. Neither does the God of this world or the enemies of God. It's undefiled. It is as pure today as it ever has been. And it fadeth not away, no matter how many have already entered into that rest that's promised from God. They haven't reduced the availability of it, the power of it, the magnitude of it, or the length of it, because it's eternal in any way. And it's ready to be revealed in the last time. So what is the last time? Guess what? We are there. The last times have been going on for 2,000 years, but boy, are we seeing a fulfillment of the prophecies in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus prophesying in the Olivet Discourse or up on the Mount of Olives, and in Revelation. The times are upon us, so we have to be ready. Then in verses 6 and 9, God is with us through this whole journey. Draw near to him. Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. He has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Jesus never promises that life would be without its trials, without its difficulties, without its tribulations. But he does say you don't have to fear anything that man or this world can do, for he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Psalm 46, verses 7 to 11. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. He who delivered Abraham and Isaac and Jacob will also deliver us. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What's going to come? What desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. That will be during his thousand year reign. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Amen. And then a very familiar passage for many of us in James chapter 4, verses 7 to 8. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. So knowing these things, verses 7 and 8 of Joshua chapter 1, gives us warning. Do not let the book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. Make it the consuming passion in your life to read God's Word, to memorize God's Word, to meditate on God's Word, 
to seek to understand by the power of the Holy Spirit the meaning of God's word. And when you do this, it puts everything else in perspective because you cannot do it without Jesus and without God's word. Now this is the point in the weekly devotion when normally I would do a song, but the Lord spoke to my heart this week that there was to be no song. Because there is tragedy in this world. There are things going on that we couldn't have imagined a year ago, maybe even six months ago. And, and I want to give you a perspective to think about in closing that puts all of this into the right focus for us going forward. Black lives matter. There is no doubt that to Jesus Christ, the lives of Africans, the lives of African Americans matter. And I believe that to the depth of my heart. But I want also to say, Hispanic lives matter. Asian lives matter. White lives matter. Jewish lives matter. Christian lives matter. Muslim, Hindu, I don't care what religion, their lives matter to God. Unsaved lives matter. Elderly lives matter. Young lives matter. Unborn baby lives matter. And as much as it's tragic that there has been so much prejudice and bigotry exercised against so many black lives in this country, <laughs> the other lives that I talked about just in these last several slides, they have all also received oppression bigotry and prejudice. And in nation rising against nation, which Jesus prophesied in Matthew chapter 24, the word is ethnos against ethnos. And ethnicity, this whole prejudicial hatred of someone because they are not of your kind. It's a great affront to God's creation of all kinds, his love for all kinds, and Jesus' sacrifice for all kinds. And do not forget it. Don't be swayed by a single focus, which really is just another attempt to bring greater division between ethnicities. And in the end, remember, Jesus' life is the one that matters. Because his is the life that was sacrificed for all of these other lives. And just to make a point, to think about a racial people and be concerned about them, and forget about the millions upon millions of unborn babies that we have slaughtered over the course of the last 58 years since Roe v. Wade. Some of the people who are fighting for the rights of the blacks or the Hispanics or the Asians or whatever have no problem with the fact that we've killed so many millions of our own people. And it is tragic. It's all tragic. Every death is tragic, even the death of the elderly, because man was made to be eternal. 
And had we obeyed in the garden, there would be no death. But because we disobeyed, Christ's life was given to ensure that ultimate heritage of eternal life in heaven with the Lord. And I just want to close with two verses of Scripture, two passages. 1 Kings 19, verses 9 to 13. This is God talking to Elijah. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there, Elijah, fleeing from Jezebel. We don't need to flee from this world or anyone who's threatening us in this world. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. These, the, the professed believers in our land, we've forsaken the covenant. We've thrown down the altars, and, and we worship in an altar of gold. And we've slain the prophets with the sword. We don't value the truth that comes from those few pulpits where it does come. And in some instances, we think we're the only ones left, but see what God says. <clears throat> and he said, God said, Go forth, stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains, tore them apart, and break in pieces the rocks, before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. Because the wind and the earthquake and the fire, those are destructive forces. God is a creator, He's a builder. He may allow the destructive forces to come in for his purpose, but he's not in the destructive forces. He's the creator. He's the restorer. He is the rebuilder. He's the reconciler. And after the fire, a still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And that voice from the Holy Spirit of God would say to you, Where are you today? Are you focused on the wind and the earthquake and the fire? God is not in those things. He may be using them, to draw people to him and to warn us that we really are at the end of this age. But he's in the still small voice. He's in his word speaking to you, calling to you, crying out to you, saying, where are you? In all of this mess, where are you? Are you strong? Are you courageous? Are you looking to the inheritance? Have you crossed the river of baptism? Are you prepared to cross the Jordan into the promised land? Do you know that he's walking with you? And then finally, back in Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 to 15. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. 
And Joshua went unto him and said to him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place wherein thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. The captain of the Lord's army, that's Jesus Christ, prior to coming as the baby in the manger. He's the captain of the Lord's army, sword drawn, ready to fight God's battle. And if you were, were to ask him, are you for us or are you for the enemies? He'd say, neither. I am for the Lord God of heaven and whose side are you on? <laughs> Do you realize when you are in my presence, you are on holy ground? Take off your shoes, bow your head, humble yourself and come fight with me. And if you do so, you will find that all lives matter. God bless you.